You need to tell him the All phone. right. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and welcome to the social equity um, subcommittee meeting for this week. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order officially and also take attendance. So I'm going to start with the subcommittee members. And Julio, I can see you, so I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, Julio Thompson, Civil Rights Unit, AG's office here. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, and then Nader? Present. Thank you so much. Susanna? I'm here, and I'm going to sign out and back in again. I'm oh, you can't see it? Team. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, it's all good. And then Lindsay? I am here. Hi, everyone. Fantastic. From NACB, we have myself. We have Gina Cranwinkle. Present. Jeffrey Gallegos. Present. And John. Present. Wonderful. And then from the CCB, um, we have, I think I saw Julie. And then um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Wonderful, fantastic. Welcome, Kimberly, and welcome to the members of the public. So attendance has been taken. Um, as I do each week, I will go back and just remind everyone that these are our milestones with our next one coming on Friday. So uh, exciting stuff. I know Gina is very enthusiastic to get these reports in. So um, let me move over now to, we're gonna go through a few different things today, including the um, Cannabis Business Development Fund, then also um, a couple of other things that will be presented today, including the Cannabis Social Equity Board, Social Equity Application Approvals, and then of course we have time for public comments in person. There were no public comments this week that we received electronically, so um, I would like to remind anyone watching this um, recording or anyone that's with us today, if you would like to make public comments, that you may do so at ccg.vermont.gov. And there is a public input form, very easy to find. And uh, we welcome all comments. And I would like also for everyone to rest assured that comments are reviewed by each of the subcommittee members. They are disseminated among them so that um, they are able to hear what the citizens of Vermont have to say. So with that being said, let's move to the last order of housekeeping business. And I would like to see if we could get a motion to approve the meeting minutes for Thursday, October 7th. Uh, I'll make that motion. Fantastic. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right, let's get started. And um, Gina, I'm going to turn this over to you. You should be able to drive if you'd like to. If not, I will keep going for you. Oh, I'm good. So we are going to get into what the Cannabis Development Fund, how are we gonna get funding for this? Um, right now we have $500,000 that will be allocated. Um, and possible funds may be included as $50,000 from each integrated licensee. Right now, we cannot say if there's going to be any of these licenses. I know they believe that there may be, um, so that that is extremely limited. So one of the recommendations is that 5% of cannabis tax revenue goes to funding the program, and this is every single year. Uh, because obviously our first year is going to be the most expensive year um, and we do not have a way that is set up yet to keep this program funded and moving into, into future years. And then a creation of a social equity cannabis trust should be developed to allow anybody who would like to publicly donate to the fund to keep it funded. On um, some of the expenditures, for the program, but not limited to these things, are educational courses. So we were ter we were speaking about certificates, um, so that people can be educated in things like cultivation, extraction, retail, um, workshops, um, which were in regards to, you know, how to <clears throat> help with assistance with applications. You know, learning about accounting. Um, we need to also do some marketing and outreach of the program. 
um, the funding for a social equity co-op program and if funds permit or if we can get a bank to supplement this low interest loans and grants to social equity licenses right now with the funds being as limited as they are we can um we really have to look at alternative ways to really supplement loans and grants um, to social equity licenses so we will be seeing what is out there and what banks would be willing to partner um, with this program so one of the things that i'd like to talk about is sort of this recommendation you know how do we continue to support um, the social equity program moving forward. Julio, how do you feel about 5% of academic tax revenue going um, back to fund this program? Um, on its face, it sounds reasonable to me. I'm not sure what uh, legislation permits us to you know, set a tax rate, or I guess we would be recommending a tax rate, and so taxing is usually considered a legislative function, but um, it, it doesn't strike me as, as out of place, no. Okay. Yeah, these are all recommendations. Everything that we're going to be suggesting in this program is just all recommendations um, moving forward. Nada, how do you feel about 5% um, of cannabis tax revenue to go forward to fund the program? I mean, I personally, I don't really know enough about what, you know, the potential revenue will be. So, I mean, I can't say that 5% is a good or a bad number. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I think we do, obviously, we need to fund the program. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what a good percentage would be, but uh, if 5% is generally what's considered reasonable, then um, I can defer to that. Okay, thank you. Susanna, your thoughts, feelings? I have, I have a lot of questions. Um, one, yeah, I would say, I would want to know the breakdown of how the other 95% would be used. And are we talking 5% of the previous year's tax revenue from this market or projected for the current year, how do, 5% of what, I guess, because I imagine that's going to vary from year to year, and um, and then I guess how it, I know this is a different, maybe I'm, I'm a little too far ahead, but how it's spent. Um, so in other words, if that 5% goes to fund the fund and then it dries up, then what? Will we have doled it out to ask, will we have used it? If there are things we wanted to do with it that it, did, it didn't stretch enough to be able to do, are we committed to supplementing the fund to ensure that all of that work can be done, or is five percent of the tax revenue supposed to be the only source that funds it? And yeah, yeah, it's great questions. Um, unfortunately, I we. I don't know what the other 95% will be going to. I believe that there is another um, program out there that is um, that they want to supplement. I think about like cannabis education. Um, Julie, would you know what yeah. this so um, the, cannabis tax revenue they're thinking yeah. about doing? So the 6% sales tax is going to go to after school programs. That's already outlined in the legislation. And then 30% of the the, so on top of the 6% sales tax, there's a 14% excise tax. 30% of the revenue from that is to go to prevention programs. The other is in the general fund. It's not otherwise, you know, uh, claimed in the legislation yet. Thank you. So that's, so that's 30% of the 14%, which still leaves behind 70% of the 14% excess tax, that's right? Correct. Yep, that's correct. I mean, you know, it seems to me that for a state that frequently runs a surplus to now be creating a new tax that is quite high, I feel like 5% is 
is very modest, and we could probably afford to do better with that. And there, we will be discussing later on, um, I think next week, um, on Thursday actually, about additional funding going to those impacted communities. So for example, you know, opportunity zones that we have um, created and also, you know, maybe communities of high uh, BIPOC um, areas in order to get to the root cause of the problem to really change that. Um, so there will be recommendations made in order to really reverse this problem that has happened there. If that's, if that's a, a forthcoming recommendation, then I would be comfortable with that. You would not be comfortable, you said? I would. I would, I would if we did have that, that, that added track of being able to get at some of those upstream factors, then I would be very comfortable with that, and I wouldn't necessarily push to raise this 5% if we also are going to be finding other ways to address some of those upstream factors. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, you were just going in and out a little bit. Um, thanks. And Lindsay, um, uh, what are your thoughts? So I actually really agree with that. What you know, everybody has said thus far. I do. Um, I struggle with whether that five percent is the right number because I again don't know what the realm of the possibilities are in terms of the sun revenue, or is this five percent of the fourteen percent? Um, so I think those details are going to really matter. Um, but I know we have to sort of have a starting point too. So, I mean, in terms of kind of starting somewhere, and I know that if the legislators will hash this out when they're creating policy, um, then there's, there's, there's that, right? So um, I'm, I'm indifferent, I'm supportive of, of something being there because I, I believe we have to build this fund, but I just am struggling with the right number. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, these, this is definitely a, a number that needs to be looked at and, and thoroughly investigated as the program permits. And then we will also be talking about an advisory um, social equity board as well today. So I think, you know, those are the things that the social equity board needs to really address, you know, because we don't know how much it's going to cost. We don't know how many participants are going to be out there. Um, so this needs to be revisited in six months to a year after the program ha has started i'm um, really to get a true understanding of you know exactly how much does it need to be funded and does that come from um, tax revenue or does that come from the state of Ver vermont itself or the cannabis control board and then the second thing was to create a social equity cannabis trust um, so that if people would like to donate um, to the program that we can get funding um, that way. Julio, your thoughts? I think that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's ensuring that there's, you know, the appropriate mechanisms so that it's a blind trust so that you don't have any concerns about influence uh, through contribution. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's, um, that could that could be really useful um, when you look at the expenditures or the potential expenditures down here uh, at least from a perspective I think that we're, the place that we're at now it's the last bullet point where I think there would be you know that could potentially be a larger number um, I think after, especially after the first year of the program where you'll have sunk costs that are uh, in developing uh, the educational courses and, and doing the rollouts, um, but uh, you know, low-interest loans or any kind of loan subsidies, grants, you know, that could be a substantial amount. And so, having a mechanism where it is, uh, you know, a protected, uh, it's a protected fund, so that it's not it doesn't drop into the general fund, uh, you know, seems. Intuitive, I, 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 intuitively appealing. I don't know, and I don't know if either you or Jeffrey or anyone else can offer any examples from uh, any other jurisdictions that have used that. 
Um, so for the ca Social Equity Cannabis Trust, the only one that I know about that is um, just in legislation process right now is Massachusetts. Um, Jeffrey, do you know of any other states that are thinking about doing a cannabis trust? I mean, I'm I not know off the top right now. I just put it in my notes. I'll take a look and see if I can find any, but I, as of right now, I don't know. I, I don't believe, I, I'm not sure, but okay. I do know Massachusetts have been thinking about it. And it's just um, a sort of a creative way to try to get funding um, for these programs and, and support for these programs. But I agree with you. Um, right now, the fund is not large enough to give anybody a low interest loan or a grant um, that would be worthwhile to any business, unfortunately. Um, and then with all the operating expenses, educational courses, marketing outreach, um, you know, which is why we sort of made a suggestion of really pooling the funds together and creating a co-op um, for people because you know, that would be a real significant way to reduce the barrier of entry. Um, also, you know, I think one of the things to do is to really work with some Vermont, um, you know, credit unions um, in order to try to see, you know, if they would be able to um, subsidize this for us, you know, create low interest loans, or, you know, find out if there are some grant programs out there um, for social equity candidates. Um, so I, this is just the starting point that we're going to be definitely looking at alternative ways to really kind of maximize um, our dollars, but also maximize what we can use partnerships with other people in order to supplement what we have already. And the same thing will go with any educational courses that we can um, try to see or mentorships or other incubator programs that people will be willing uh, to participate with the Vermont um, social equity program. Nada, how do you feel about this? Um, one question I had is, do we know if donations to this trust would be uh, tax deductible? The reason I'm asking is, you know, that if they were tax deductible, they would you know, it would certainly attract more donors in the future. So I'm, I was just curious. I know we were speaking about this with Julio the other day, and also um, Ben. Um, Julio. I don't know that they can be made federally deductible. Whether it's deductible for the state of Vermont, <laughs> that's, that's just a matter of what. You have you would have to have some amendment to the tax code to account for that. So that's that's sort of I don't think there's anything that would prohibit it, but you would have to have a change in the code. But as far as the federal code, I don't. I, that seems doubtful. I, I'm not a tax attorney, but just because it's not a recognized trade. Um, and if this if this fund were operated um, purely to advance that you know that trade and not, not have any other purpose, uh, that's probably likely. If if there were a trust fund that were associated with it, which is just a trust fund devoted to sowing money back into community redevelopment, but that doesn't actually reach the market participants conceivably uh, that might even achieve a federal deduction but I, I you know we would have to talk with the, the tax you know better uh, equipped tax professionals in the state of Vermont about that but I think I think contributions to make the market go or a segment of the market go it seems unlikely to me from a federal level I agree, Julio. I don't think it's, there's going to be any um, tax deduction for a cannabis program on the federal level. I mean, would you like us to make a, a recommendation to see if a tax deduction can be made um, for the state of Vermont? I mean, it, it, it sounds like there'd be a lot of um, hoops to jump through to, to get that, but you know, I, I do think it could be worthwhile 
um, in order to attract more donors to the fund. Um, you know, because it, I, I think it's important that we have multiple funding mechanisms for this and having this trust account would be good and having, you know, a wide range of donors would also be good. So, but I mean, in general, I do support the idea of having a trust. Yeah. Thank you. Susanna? I agree. Yeah, I am. Um, I support having a trust. I support it being a blind trust. And, um, you know, on questions of, of tax deduction, you know, we can work that out in a way that's compliant with federal and in state law. But yeah, in, in general, I'm with it. And, and Lindsay, your thoughts? I'm generally with it as well. Thank you. Uh, Lily, I want to get into the idea of a blind trust. Yeah. I know you said that, you know, if we put someone's name attached to it, that they may, you know, feel that they have to um, have a responsibility of it. Um, what are your ideas if, if people were able to be named? Because that sometimes is a benefit of people saying we're supporting the Social Equity Cannabis Trust and they want to be known, um, their business to be known for that. What are your thoughts on that? Just because that sometimes can be a selling point of people making contributions. Um, I, I think that um, if you are, um, I mean, when I'm talking about blind trust, uh, I'm talking about not only the source of the donation, but also if you have a set of money, you know, that's set aside, you don't just put it in a zero interest bank account. You, it, it, you, the, you know, through the treasury department, you would have that money. If it's not, if it's not going to be immediately dispersed would be uh, subject to, you know, prudent investment. Um, and by the treasurer's office. And so we'll need input from the treasurers about where that money is expended. Um, the concern is that, I mean, there are, and, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but I am aware that, you know, there are in other parts of the country um, what are called marijuana exchange traded funds where investors uh, invest in the income stream they trade the income stream or projected income stream of marijuana uh, cultivators and distributors and, and retailers uh, and so um, I, I think if you know we need to we need uh, we need to just have additional input about how the trust would be administered because uh, you could have a situation where someone is donating a large amount in Vermont and there would be concern, even the appearance of impropriety is something that you have to be careful of. And so the question would be whether if there were a big market player that comes from somewhere within Vermont or from outside of Vermont that provides a lot, a lot of, amount of money and then also, you know, publicly advocates that the money that's in the pot be invested in some aspect of the marketplace that might be beneficial to them. Um, you just have to account for that possibility that, because uh, um, again, trust funds or reserve funds typically just don't sit in a vault. They're invest, they're reinvested in the market to yield. Uh, Trade and because there, because marijuana is a new is new commerce. Um, I just I, I'm wary of situations where players might be using kind of using the size or the notoriety of their donation to um, raise concerns that they're you know they are they are on the on the other end other than just being uh, maybe having the the publicity and the good feeling that comes from contributing to part of, the, of this economy that they have some benefit uh, in, you know, in, in trade later on. That's what, that's what I'm concerned about is just making sure that there's no 
uh, and you know the the professionals who um, who are, will be aware of those appropriate safeguards and methods of or the, the standards for investment are really uh, folks in the treasurer's office, and I'm not really you know <laughs> the qualified to elaborate further, but that's really what I'm talking. Thank you, Leo, for clarifying that for us. Um, I would like to vote on this recommendation of 5% of cannabis tax revenue goes to fund the program and that a creation of a social equity cannabis trust to allow for public donation and the, obviously the trust to be set up determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, Nader, how, how do you vote? Um, I, sorry if I heard wrong from earlier, but I thought we were going to be diving more into what what the number should be, or did we all agree that 5% is the way that we're moving forward with? I think we need to um, make a recommendation that in six months um, this be re-examined to really determine um, the cost uh, of the program and the revenue that that is being made. Um, I see Lindsay's hand up. I'm, I'll, I'll call on you in a minute. Nada, what is your question? So, so is this 5%? I right don't know what the cost of the program is going to be. Okay, so is this 5%? Um, is this just a placeholder for now until more, um, until we understand more six months down the road? Yes. Okay, um, then, then I'll vote yes. Sure. And we're, we're put a caveat that it needs to be re-examined in six months to determine that 5% of ca cannabis tax revenue is sufficient to fund the program. Um, Lindsay, your hand was raised. It, it was really the same thing. I wanted to see if we could revise what we're voting on a little bit because it feels like I don't want it to, to be portrayed that I'm, you know, set on that 5% when I feel like there's a lot of unknowns. So if we can just revise, you know, what we're agreeing to right now and, and suggest that as a starting point or that it will be revisited or something of the such that would make me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, maybe we can say that cannabis tax revenue goes to funding the program and not put any percentage in. I can, Nada, how do you feel about that, Lindsay? Yeah, I could get there for sure. Um, again, but I also think there's a, a place where there could be a conversation about a set amount that establishes this as well as opposed to a tax. So I guess I'm just trying to leave that door open a little bit, but I understand why you feel like we definitely need a, a recommendation to start with. Thank you. I think it's really important because right now not, there's nothing in the law that says that this will be refunded. So I think some sort of recommendation to say that money, that this program needs to be replenished because we don't want it just operational for one year. Um, Nada, um, do you want it to say that cannabis tax, tax revenue goes to funding the program? Or I, do you I, not I want to like, have any percentage? I would like percentage? cannabis tax revenue to fund the program, yes. Julio, your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think I'm comfortable with saying at least 5%. And, and, w and I understand with the caveat that it would be re revisited. And the reason I say that is because at least I'm anticipating that a component of fund spending will be loans and grants. Uh, I'm reasonably confident, I feel reasonably confident that 5% in the first year won't be too much money set aside um, because there's enormous capital costs that are associated with the startup of this industry. Um, any kind of growing related industry, I think there's a lot of capital costs. Uh, I, and even though I don't know the, the gross amount which is a perfectly valid point that everybody has raised. Um, I, I kind of look at it in terms of proportionality. So it, to me, it's like, does it seem reasonable that 95% of the money uh, goes to uh, things other than something related to social equity? 
to me that seems more than generous to the non-social equity part of it, at least proportionally. Um, and so it might be that the number, we might see the numbers and want to increase it. Um, and, and it could be five years from now, it's such, such a successful program that 5% is really flush and the market is kind of established and there aren't that many new loan applicants and there isn't that much new capital that the market has sort of reached its equilibrium. But I think like in a startup year, I just don't, I'm, I, I'm not worried about 5% being too much of a set aside. So that, so I can go with, without leaving the number in, or I, I would be equally comfortable saying, you know, a minimum of 5% goes to the fund, the program subject to evaluation and it, it's six months when revenues are more, you know, when projections can be tested against actual returns, something like that. A much shorter version, let's just say. Okay, there we are. So we're going to make this recommendation, and I can't um, type and fix it, but it will go to at least 5% of cash, a cannabis tax revenue goes to fund programs to be revisited in six months, um, every six months to make sure that program is adequately funded and that a creation of a social equity cannabis trust be established for public donations and type of trust to be determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, Nader, how do you feel about that revision? Yes or, or no to that? Yeah, I'm good with that. And then Julio? Yes. Great. Great. We get some funding for this program. Yay. Um, so just for the record, um, two yeses to the recommendations um, with the edits that we have made. Um, that at least 5% of cannabis tax revenue goes to fund programs and every six months um, it should be revisited to ensure that the program is adequately funded and a creation of a social equity cannabis trust to allow for public donations of the program type of trust to be determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Now we're going to consider representatives for the Cannabis Social Equity Board. So, you know, we really want to have six to 12 members um, to represent our social equity candidates and to ensure that the program is moving, um, that there are no issues, or if there are, that we're addressing them. Also, every six months, you know, looking at the program, is this really fulfilling what we believe the program should be helping? You know, are we doing enough? Do we need to revisit it? Do we need more education? Um, do we need more funding? Um, so here are some um, suggestions of representatives. I guess let's start with how many people do you think should be on the board? Nada, um, I'm putting here about six to 12 members. Uh, what number are, are you feeling? Should it be more towards the six or, or more towards the 12? Uh, I, my first thought is, could we try to have it be an odd number for the sake of voting? So six to 12, so we could have 11, we could have seven, we could have five, we could have 13. Yeah. What, what uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure right off the bat with um, how many members we should assign to this. I think we need to get an idea of um, interest in the board because we don't want to you know, propose 11 members, but then we only get four or five people who are actually interested and available to meet. Um, so I'm not quite sure yet on mm -hmm. an exact number at the moment. Okay, and Julio, do you have a number in your mind or shall we just head to some of the people we think that would be beneficial for the board? You're on mute. Uh, I'm, I'm closer to the 12 end than to the 6 end. I think there are too many different um, voices that would be really beneficial to us. So um, 
So I would I would head for 13 members rather than five. That that's where I would go. So one of the first ones we were thinking about is to have a small business um, representative on the board um, to to help with any some some business issues that do come up. A really important thing is to have a licensed cannabis representative. So to have a retailer, a processor, a cultivator, um, to have each part sort of the sector covered so that we can understand the different issues that they may be having um, in those sectors or how those um, probably run in order to determine what education or what incubator programs or any assessments need to be added. Um, I think it's extremely important to have a representative from a disproportionately impacted community who has experience in community development, um, a representative from the BIPOC community, someone from the Opportunity Zone, um, the Department of Racial Equity and Diversity. You know, Susanna Davis has been with us through this entire panel, I think. Um, there's something to be said to continue on the board, as you know, where we've sort of started from and what the actions and importance of this program is, or, or someone from your office. Um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, I know, Lindsay, um, you've been on these calls with us and had external calls as well about it. Um, a representative from a co-op, um, if that does get off the ground so we understand what the issues are having there. Um, a member of the Social Equity Caucus, um, I think it'll be tremendous to get their insight uh, for the entirety of social equity in Vermont. And then someone from the Cannabis Control Board. Hi, Julie. I know uh, you or someone else might be a great candidate to, to be on the board so you know what's happening with all of um, you know what what's happening with the cannabis industry as a whole I think it's always great to have sort of these different perspectives and if it was going to be an even number of members um, that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board as as the tiebreaker if there if there was a tie on an issue that's if we have um, an even number. I mean, I, I definitely agree that an odd number just makes everything easier so that we don't have to go to a tiebreaker. So Julio, your thoughts about some of the representatives we've added onto the side? Uh, I would say that um, I'd, I'm not sure I understand that. The Social Equity Caucus, is that the legislative caucus? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm interested in, and I'm just trying to do my, my finger counting here. I'm interested and more community representatives or people who've been affected by you know the legacy that this is sort of responding to um uh i think that um i don't like i don't so i don't when it says representative from opportunity zones is that a resident or is that someone who runs an opportunity zone program i'm not sure I think a resident or maybe someone who runs them. I, I think it, we're kind of keeping it open-ended, but I would want someone who, you know, is from the Opportunity Zone area along with the BIPOC community. We have also someone from a disproportionately impacted community who has experience in community development, um, as we would want to continue to help the communities that we're saying need it the most. Um, and then we also, um, I have a representative from the co-op, which would be one of a social equity member. Um, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm definitely, if we go with 12, one third of the board would definitely have a direct relation to the people we are trying to help. Okay. 
Okay. Um, I think that's my, again, I kind of lean towards greater membership with the idea that the, um, the professionals who provide kind of the business expertise can always provide or the board can request their, you know, their expert opinion on things. I don't know that they need to vote um, on it necessarily. Um, I, so that's kind of where I am and I'm interested in, in the reactions to that. In terms of the, the language that, um, you know, when you're talking about um, community representation, um, we, we do have language that, um, um, like I am, um, I'm going to put it in the chat here, and I really pull this out of statutes that Vermont has enacted in the past as part of an effort to um, you know, have a diverse uh, a diverse input or participation in in government related policy making. Um, so this this is language that I just pulled um, from the statute that creates the executive Ec director of racial equity. Um, that's that's statute um, and I think we ought to and we have several other statutes that use almost identical language um, and so I'm just going to put the link to that statute there if people want to look at the entire statute because I think ge geographical diversity and uh, you know history of working for, for um, Vermonters who've had negative impacts from either enforcement or other aspects of state involvement I think is is a valuable um, measure of, of contribution to. Thank you. I mean we can add if you like um, someone who has been incarcerated due to the war on drugs as well that would be a good member to add. Yeah, I don't know that you would make that like a right per se requirement. I think if people were going to apply, I'm not, I think we're, I might be getting a little ahead of the process here by contemplating how they would be selected. If you, especially if you have more applicants than you do uh, seats. Um, so, I, you know, I'm open to that. I'm, I'm interested in hearing other reactions to that. Maybe um, there will be public comment on the subject as well. So we have about one third right now that would come from communities that we would want to help. Um, that's including a representative from the co-op if, if that does happen. Um, yeah, one the third would come from cannabis and from the cannabis industry, which is you know representatives from retail processors, cultivators, a member of the social equity, uh, the Vermont Cannabis Control Board, and then a third would be represent from the government. Um, Nader, your thoughts? Um, yeah, just before time runs out, I just wanted to throw out that I, um, you know, after reading this and thinking about it for a few more minutes, I'm leaning strongly towards having even higher represent people from disproportionately impacted communities. Um, you know, I, I think that if we're creating a cannabis social equity board, we want to have a large representation of the people who are directly impacted and um, you know people who can share lived experience uh, with the board so just wanted to throw out those two cents no i think that's great and um also one of the things that can possibly happen is to bring those people in um you know and have also guests who speak on certain um topics that they may be covering as well. I think it's always important to get as many voices as possible. Susanna, um, your thoughts on this? Yeah, we're definitely going to have to find a good balance of quality and quantity. 
So um, I, I like that we're thinking strategically about odd numbers versus even numbers so that decision making can be easier. And you know, as somebody who's um, scarred from being put on a 29 member commission recently, I, I am leery of large groups. However, again, this is something that so many people have been shut out for so long that you do need to have that broad representation so I'm comfortable with um, I'm comfortable with a sort of mid size to larger size group. At least, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm comfortable with it, just with the understanding that sometimes decision making can be more difficult the larger groups get. Um, and I also do think that having people with lived experience is really important. And lived experience means a lot of things. In, in this realm. It could mean lived experience in the industry, it could mean lived experience being harmed by the system, or it could mean lived experience in a different business sector, maybe not this one. So there's lots of ways that we could get at that. Um, I would just also want us to, to be broad when we think about what diversity means, because a lot of times we just assume it means racial diversity, but you know, we're also talking about a business market where people living with disabilities may be able to find opportunity, or people who, um, who may have other demographic markers that, that get overlooked. So I would just want to be pretty broad in thinking about that. And I also appreciate Julio um, sharing that language that reminds us about geographic diversity as well. Um, you know, yeah. of course, the Race Equity Office, whether it is formally or informally part of the work, is um, excited to participate. So, you know, yeah. Thanks. Um, Julio, I'm going to go to your comment, and I just wanted to let everyone know, and you know, just really start thinking about this so that when we come in to discuss this on Thursday, we really have a starting point of who would you like to take off, who would you like to add, what are some numbers that you would like. Um, Julio? Yeah, I, I just, when we think, we, I'm just, I was going to respond to your one third, one third, one third proposal. I, I, I'm, I think I'm more comfortable in light of the comments that I've heard so far with a 50% from the community, 25 and 25 from the other, from the remaining quarters. Um, it is true that people will have input, but it's also true that um, this piece of the larger industry is looking at people who have either been affirmatively harmed by enforcement policies or who otherwise might have might have then or still be kind of shut out of actual decision making. Uh, and uh, a vote is a very powerful thing, even if it's not a legislative vote, so it's not a board vote. Um, and I think as experience teaches us what other operational, you know, what other needs this board has. And I think they'll probably, I'm guessing the CCB will have other committees or advisory groups that will focus on the more economic uh, aspects that are, or enforcement aspects are important. But uh, I think you can always grow or, or ch change. Uh, I, I think 13 is not so big that if you needed to add a couple of seats or you have 15, it's it's unmanageable. Twenty nine is <laughs> that's 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 a big that's a big group. I w I wouldn't favor anything like that. But I view for something like this where you're talking about the, the size of this market, we think is that's going to happen. I I, I don't think thirteen uh, is uh, maybe it's mid size. Yeah, I would say that. But I, I like more at least like the roughly fifty percent community okay. that responds to the community and then 25 25 because I still think that's enough to have that expertise have input and, and influence among the board in terms of reaching consensus hopefully I'm most thank, thank you Julio Tanika I know it's public comment time <laughs> Nada before we go are you okay with what Julio just uh, recommended which is the size of 13 and 50 25 25 yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
We are going to bring this to public comments on. Thank you, Nada, uh, for that answer. I will come up with some, some more categories to get closer to those numbers. And Julie, um, do we have anyone who would like to make public comments? We have one public comment. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to thank you for bringing the energy on this Tuesday that feels like a Monday, but um, obviously uh, I'm still catching up. Um, thank you again for bringing the energy today. This was a really great meeting to be here for. Um, I have been following along closely with a group called the Working Group Coalition, and they recently released a resource that I will share to the online public comment. Uh, which is the Cannabis Social Equity Policy Advocacy Handbook. Um, and so just doing a quick review with that, um, they, they just did a presentation on it last week. Um, I have a couple of suggestions for you when it comes to the Social Equity Board just to consider, um, particularly from the BIPOC community, looking at uh, BIPOC-owned businesses, so somebody who's already running a business in the state, um, representing different parts of the state, uh, also a lawyer or accountant, somebody providing professional services um, to the BIPOC community or a, BIPOC, a member of the BIPOC community providing those services. Um, also looking at national nonprofit experience, so whether it's someone from an organization such as the NAACP, which I know has struggled to really get uh, their feet under them here in Vermont uh, and might be looking for certain avenues to take or any of the cannabis-specific nonprofits, uh, particularly uh, one that's focused on uh, expungement and getting people who were previously incarcerated for cannabis into the professional cannabis world. Um, somebody from who is either a member of the BIPOC community or providing medical services to the BIPOC community, since we know there is a lot of um, disparity there. Uh, from the opportunity zones, potentially an educator. We know that there's a lot of impact from the war on drugs on graduation rates. Um, so any, any representation there. Uh, also, having worked with the Department of Health myself, I would recommend something, uh, maybe a representative from WIC, who might be familiar with the types of services and the family impacts uh, in the state. And then lastly, someone from Veteran Affairs, uh, again, who might potentially have been working with folks in the state, um, maybe not necessarily impacted by the war on drugs, but by cannabis prohibition, certainly. Uh, so that's my first comment. Um, my second is uh, I did submit, and I mentioned this last week, a written public comment. It hasn't made its way through the gauntlet yet, um, but it is about social consumption. And I apologize because all of you have heard me, and I, I hate uh, sounding like a broken record. That written comment does have. Uh, a lot of information that I haven't said. It's breathy, it's wordy, it's lengthy. Um, but I just want to give you a snapshot of it, which is uh, in reference to a very close friend of mine whose father recently went into an assisted living facility for his Parkinson's care. Um, he's someone who has been using cannabis for 50 years of his life to help maintain uh, quality of life and certainly more so in the last 20 years with his Parkinson's. Um, care has become too much of a burden for his family. It, it was becoming impossible to care for him at home, and we have a shortage of home caregivers in the state. So he's gone into a facility uh, or a residence with the idea that Medicaid will eventually take over uh, the cost of that for the family. And he is getting better care than he previously has, um, but it is a Medicaid-funded facility, at least in part. And so he is not allowed to consume cannabis there. He's not allowed to have cannabis on site with him. Um, so now it's on the family to, to help him with that outside of the, the residence. Um, the only option that we have is to either bring him to, a, to one of our private homes, which we're lucky within the family we have those, um, but they are an additional 20 minutes home, 20 minutes back. Um, that's the only legal way for him to currently consume cannabis. It's basically introduced a whole other burden, including the mental health crisis that this has caused for him being a 70-year-old man um, and, and now being told that he can't use cannabis for the first time in his life, which he has been very lucky 
to use cannabis that full time. Um, there's a lot of members of society who haven't had that privilege. Um, that's a hard context to ask a seven year old to understand though. Um, so when we talk about social consumption, when you eventually do see all of the information in this written comment, I want you to think of uh, this gentleman that I was just talking about and the fact that we would love to be able to have a third party place for him to go, um, somewhere where he can legally consume cannabis. Because like I said, the only legal option is home consumption. That doesn't happen often. A lot of the times I see friends and family smoking in cars, smoking in parking lots, this type of public consumption that uh, I think the board doesn't want to see with my public health background. I don't want to see that. Um, it, it's That's not ideal. Um, none of it is ideal, but it, at least social consumption would provide an option. Um, the other folks who are mentioned in my public comment include people who are in public housing, people with a tough landlord who doesn't allow them to smoke or even have cannabis on site. Uh, the fact that if you have a neighbor who doesn't like you and wants to call the cops and say, I smell weed even when you're not smoking weed and it can result in a police interaction that could be very unpleasant. Um, I just want to continue to provide more context for you all to consider, especially since I know um, there's the opportunity to potentially include some vague wording about revisiting social consumption in this report to legislators, uh, just maybe planting some seeds and watering them with time because if we can't get it in right now, I think it is important for Vermont to see it in the near future. Um, so thank you very much again uh, for your time and all your work. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And that's it for public comment, Tina. Thank you so much. Um, I know Lindsay put in the comments that you would like to see someone from the Agency of Agriculture to the board and, um, you know, geographical representation. So we will take that all into consideration um, when we come back. So please look this over, you know, uh, send me an email if there are any more thoughts that you have before our Thursday call. And remember, we're also going to be talking about social equity applicants and you know who should be approving that so please do look through the presentation that was sent to you today um so we can get started and we will give you an updated one to include a couple more topics that we can hopefully get to on thursday as well so thank you everyone thank you for the public comments thank you for all your thoughts i would go back to the drawing board add some more to uh, this cannabis social equity board. So thank you all for your time and I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. I have a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'll make that motion. Can I have a second? I think we had two first. Second. Thank you so much.